Good morning. We are glad that you are here with us uh, in worship today. We're looking forward to a great day together. It's been a wonderful week uh, here around uh, Calvary and this facility uh, with Vacation Bible School. So many kids and leaders that uh, have come through our doors this week that we've had the opportunity uh, to share the gospel with. We've seen children come to Christ this week, and it's just been uh, a fantastic time. Thank you to all of you who are able to uh, be here physically and help serve, and those of you who prayed and supported VBS, uh, we had a great week, and uh, we are looking forward to being able to follow up with many of those kids and families uh, as well. Now, of course, as you can see uh, here this morning, we're, we're a little patriotic here this morning in our decor in the worship center, and of course, that is in large part because tonight... Uh, is our patriotic musical at 6 o'clock, and so we want to make sure that you're aware of that and uh, invite you to join us uh, this evening uh, at 6 o'clock. We're just uh, looking forward to a great time together uh, of just uh, celebration uh, and worship through that time. I think we're going to have a, a dessert fellowship afterward and just a chance to spend some time together as a church family, so we want to invite you back tonight. Uh, at 6. We encourage you to invite someone to come along with you, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, that time together tonight. Uh, and as always, if you happen to be visiting with us uh, today, if you're a guest with us this morning here in our service, we're so glad uh, that you're here, that you've chosen to come and to worship with us at Calvary today. And uh, if you would like the opportunity just to connect with us, uh, if there's any questions you might have, or just to let us know that you are here um, there's a number that you can see on the screen. You can just simply text the word welcome to that number, and that'll give us an easy way to connect with you and uh, know that you were here. And uh, as I said, maybe answer any questions you might have and just let you know uh, of our appreciation for you being here with us uh, today. Well, we're going to continue in worship. We're going to sing together here in just a moment. But before we do that, uh, I'm going to pray for us. And so if you would, please just join me. Father, uh, we are grateful for the opportunity to gather here uh, this morning and worship as, as we always are. We, do, we don't take times like these for granted when we get the privilege of being together as a church family. Worshiping you, studying your word, uh, just getting to spend time with one another. Uh, Lord, we're grateful for uh, those opportunities. We, we, we thank you and we praise you for this past week and the opportunity we had uh, through Vacation Bible School to, to minister to so many children and their families, to share the love of Jesus with them. We, uh, we are grateful uh, for just being entrusted with that, uh, with that privilege and that responsibility to be able to, to do that this past week. And, and so we just thank you for that. We look forward to uh, the rest of the summer and opportunities for ministry that still uh, lie ahead of us. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you would continue to allow us as a, a church family just to be, to be diligent and to be focused uh, on, on the mission at hand, uh, just sharing the good news of the gospel with this community. And uh, we thank you again just for the privilege of being a part uh, of this body here and uh, worshiping and serving uh, you here. And as we do those things today, we just pray that it, it would all glorify you and, and bring honor to your name. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. on this stage have been in vacation Bible school all week long and it has literally at times been ear splitting in this auditorium and those of you that work vacation Bible school you know that so it's going to be a little disappointing this morning if you all kind of give me that well I'm not quite woke up I think I'll just let the person next to me sing and, and all that okay so you've really got a lot of you've got big shoes to fill is what I'm saying all right so let's stand and worship together From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea
Glory to his name. The blood has been applied. Take your Bibles and turn, if you will, to the Old Testament book of Haggai. If you go to that division between the Old and New Testament and turn back past two books, uh, Malachi and Zechariah, you'll come to Haggai. And today we're going to be looking at the entirety of the book. I'm going to preach through the entire book in this one message this morning. Now, don't get alarmed. There's only two chapters. Uh, so there are several things here that's worth noting uh, as we look at this book of Haggai. You know, a couple of months ago, uh, we bought a new smoke alarm at our house. We'd had a hard, uh, hard-wired one, and so we bought a battery-operated one. And we located it pretty close uh, to where the old one was. And uh, since we put that new alarm in, we can't cook anything without it going off. I mean, you don't even have to generate smoke. It's, it, we'll just start to cook something very simple, and off it goes. Well, our little mini poodle, Bailey, is terrified uh, when that thing starts going off. And so um, I found myself when I go in, and I get up a lot earlier than the rest of my family does, and every once in a while I'll go in and fix me a little breakfast. And I've learned that I take a dishcloth. I'm the only one that can do this in my house without a stool. And I go over and I drape that dishcloth over the alarm. And then I cook. I just want you to know if you ever come to our house and you see a dishcloth hanging on the wall covering something, we were cooking and just forgot to take it off. But I've been thinking about that alarm. Uh, it's gotten rather annoying, uh, to say the least. And so I thought, well, what do I need to do with it? Uh, just ignore it. And I find that we're doing that more and more. It goes off all the time. We don't pay attention to it. Or... I could relocate it. And then I thought that may not be a good idea because I don't want to put it too far away and it not really do the job that it's supposed to be doing just because it would make it more convenient for me. Replacing it is not really an option because obviously it's working. And so I've been thinking about that alarm over the last couple of months and it is interesting how used to something you get. It's gone off enough now that I just say, okay, uh, somebody's cooking or heating up something in the oven at this time. But you know that alarm is important. It's a reminder. It's a reminder that something may not be what it should be and that there could be a problem. And even though it's inconvenient at times to us, it's a reminder. As I began to think about our journey through the Minor Prophets, it's obvious that from time to time, the people got annoyed by what the minor prophets were having to say. And in many cases, even with some of the major prophets, uh, they tried to relocate them. Sometimes they tried to relocate them to prison. Sometimes they just tried to ignore. They just kind of thought about what they wanted to think about. They didn't want to hear anything that the prophets had to say. Uh, many times they replaced what the prophets said with what some of their own people said that sounded a little nicer and more convenient for them to be able to hear. But the prophets were God's reminder to the people when things weren't the way they were supposed to be. And one of the things I've been struck by as I've gone through the prophets uh, has been the fact that uh, many of these men, you can see it in their writings, were tremendously patriotic. They loved their country. They loved their people. But it did not keep them from warning the people that there was a problem whenever God had a message. I tell people, you can be both patriotic, I'm thinking about that even as we have our musical tonight, and still warn when things aren't the way that they should be. And that's exactly what these prophets did. And that's what Haggai was doing. He was telling the people, you need to get your act together and you need to finish what you have started. And he was reminding them that the blessing of God in their life depended upon that very thing. 
So let me give a little background. What do we know about Haggai the prophet? I guarantee you if I walked down among all of you today and I just stopped and said, can you tell me what you know about Haggai? Uh, we might be a little pressed there. It's not a book we often study. He's not a prophet we look at. His ministry was relatively short. And so it's one of those obscure prophets that we find uh, within the pages of God's Word. Well, we know a little bit. Uh, we know what his name means. His name means festival, uh, which would have been entirely appropriate because one of the ministries that Haggai had was calling the people back to worship, to spiritual worship that had to do with the rebuilding of the temple, and he called them back to observing the feast or the festivals that they observed that always caused them to stop and acknowledge God in some particular way. So the name fits the message uh, that Haggai had. We know that he's one of the few prophets who wrote after the remnant returned from captivity and began to rebuild the temple. There weren't many of those prophets in that day uh, that wrote after or during the rebuilding of the temple. If you're ever reading through the book of Ezra, and maybe you've never noticed this before, you'll come across Haggai. Ezra mentions him. First of all, in chapter 5, verse 1, Haggai is referred to as a prophet, along with Zechariah, the son of Idu. And then when you get over into chapter 6, verse 14, here's what Ezra says. Ezra mentions that the people prospered through the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah. In other words, they got off their blessed assurance and finished the temple according to the word of the Lord. And so the people actually listened. That wasn't always the case. And Ezra said the people prospered. They were blessed because they listened to what Haggai and Zechariah had to say. Well, what else do we know? We know what the main message of Haggai was. When that remnant of people came back in 538 B.C., uh, they got busy, and their mission was to go back and to rebuild the temple. You remember that Solomon's temple and all of its glory was no longer there. It had been destroyed. And they had started to build with enthusiasm. They were excited about the opportunity to do that, but the opposition was a little tougher than they thought it was going to be. And so they became discouraged. There was another thing that began to impact them, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, this temple was not going to be nearly as big and magnificent and glorious as Solomon's temple was. And so the project was dragging on a little longer than they had expected, and pretty soon uh, they became discouraged. They were no longer motivated. And let me tell you, there's a danger that comes when First of all, uh, we get discouraged in the Lord's work. We'll quit. And so they just kind of paused with that. I, I've watched that with churches over the years. I've watched that with people over the years. Uh, they get a little discouraged in some area of ministry, and they just pause. But the danger is then you begin to focus on yourself and your needs. Uh, since I'm not doing this here, I'm going to retreat to my little corner, and, uh, you know, that's too much to deal with. I'm just going to focus on me, and that's exactly what the people did in Haggai's day. They began to focus on themselves. They chose a very poor substitute for serving the Lord. They concentrated on meeting their own needs while God's house was laying in ruins. Another way of saying it they just kind of put the spiritual issues aside, and they just decided, I'm going to focus on me. Well, we know a couple of other things about Haggai, but uh, one, very briefly, is he had a really short public ministry. I said public ministry. Did you know Haggai's public ministry lasted four months? That was it. And the reason we know that is because Haggai has some very precise dating in the book. You'll see that as we go through the book today. Haggai has only two chapters, but there are four messages 
that God gives to Haggai for the people. So what I'm going to do today is we're going to look at those four messages in the entirety of the two chapters of Haggai. But I'm going to use our dating system because it'll be a little easier for us to think about how brief this ministry was, how these messages flowed along, and what God had to say uh, to the people here. So here's the first message, and we find that in chapter 1. We would date this September the 1st, 520 B.C. Keep in mind, this is 18 years after they've returned. And if you'll notice in verse 1 of chapter 1, it says, In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, they didn't count their months like we do, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. So on September the 1st, 520 B.C., Haggai talks to the people about their selfishness, and here's his word, gear up. In other words, get busy. Finish the work that God has given you to do. You see, the people love the Lord, but they had become distracted. They had become distracted by the opposition uh, that they were facing. Uh, they had become more focused, as I said, on their physical needs than their spiritual needs. And Haggai confronts them for their apathy. He confronts them for the fact, you've made sure you've got nice houses to live in, but you have neglected the Lord's work. Notice, if you will, in verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Haggai basically tells them, You need to remember what your priority is. And so he tells them to gear up. You see, when your attitude becomes apathetic, then your testimony becomes pathetic. And that's what had happened to the people. He tells them they need to gear up. You know, sometimes people think they're getting ahead in life when they invest all of their time and energy in trying to multiply resources for themselves and sing to their own need, needs. But you know what happened in Haggai's day? God, through Haggai, says, you keep that up. But you need to understand that's why I'm not blessing you. He told them, I am withholding my blessing because you put yourself first instead of the Lord. Look, if you will, in verse 6. He said, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put into a bag with holes. In other words, nothing's lasting. You're not, you're not prospering. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. God says you can go ahead and focus on yourself all you want to, and you can neglect my house, but I want you to know you will never have the blessing of God upon your life. And it kind of reminds us of a priority, doesn't it, that Jesus taught us and We read about it in the Sermon on the Mount. We've quoted it many, many times. What did Jesus tell us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33? He said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, and what things was he talking about? He was talking about all those material things. He just talked about the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. He said, all these things shall be added to you. So God says through Haggai to the people, gear up, get busy, get your priorities in order. 
That was September the 1st. Well, I want you to look, if you will, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, we have the second message. This is October the 21st, 520 B.C. It's about seven weeks later. And the second message is this. Haggai talks to the people about greatness in the eyes of the Lord, and his message to them there is wake up, gear up, and then he says, wake up, wake up, and see what God is doing. You know what the problem here was? The people were looking backward. They weren't looking forward. Solomon's temple was bigger and better than this temple was going to be. They were looking backward. Notice in verse 3 of chapter 2. Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And it's believed Haggai might have been one of those. And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, that is, in comparison with the former temple, is this not in your eyes as nothing? God was telling them, you don't really know what greatness is all about. Over in the book of Ezra, chapter 3, verse 12, and I'll just read the verse to you. There's an interesting scene that Ezra describes when the foundation of this temple is laid. And there were some people there that remembered what the old temple was. And then you had some people there that were just happy they were rebuilding the temple. And it says this in Ezra chapter 3, verse 12. Listen to this. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But listen. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. You say, well, why did they weep? They weren't weeping for joy. They were weeping because, well, this is not like it was in the good old days. This is not like it was when Solomon's temple was built. Yet many shouted aloud for joy. And verse 13 tells us something interesting. So that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people, for the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard afar off. When the people saw this scene, they couldn't tell who was weeping and who was rejoicing. You see, you had two kinds of people there when the foundation was laid. Those who say, this is not like it used to be. Not like it was when Solomon's temple was built. And then you had those that were just excited. God's temple is being rebuilt. And so he reminds them what greatness is all about. If we're not careful, sometimes the good old days as good as we might think they were, can be a discouragement instead of an encouragement. And Haggai is reminding the people of that. If we're not careful, we'll begin to throw cold water on what God's doing right now and today. And if we get hung up in the past, we can become critical of the present. And that's what Haggai is warning the people about. He said, you need to see where God is today and how he's working today. You say, well, how do you do that? Well, three times a phrase is mentioned. The phrase only has two words in it, and it's an encouragement to us. And this is what God gives to Haggai for the people. And the phrase is, be strong. In other words, the people are reminded, be strong. The civil authority is reminded to be strong. The the priests are reminded to be strong. And the people are reminded to be strong. And so God, through Haggai, is telling us why we should be strong. Why we shouldn't just look back here or talk about how it used to be. But what is God doing today? Be strong. And here are the three things he reminds us of. First of all, he reminds us that God is with us. Verse 4, yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, 
And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. Notice the five words, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. We need to remember God is with us. That's how we're strong. But they, he didn't stop it there. In verse 5, he reminds us that God will always be with us. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. God was telling the people, listen, I made an agreement with you years ago. I told you that I was going to be with you, and I want you to know my spirit is still with you. That's something the church of Jesus Christ needs to remember today. God is with us. He's still with us, and he's going to be with us until he calls us home. We can be strong. But there's a third thing. God is able. God's able to do anything that needs to be done. In verse 6, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while. In other words, not yet. Down the road, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. God announced he was going to do something great in that temple. He said it's going to be something that you've never seen before. And you know what? God did do something great in that temple. One day, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, walked into that temple. And that temple was filled with greater glory than it had ever known before. God was just saying to the people, hold on for a minute, quit looking here, and look ahead to what I'm going to do. I want you to remember the greatest thing that could ever happen in this place, in this worship center, in our educational building, in our preschool area, our children's area, our student ministry area, our pavilion, whatever it is, the greatest thing that could ever happen is for people to know that Jesus is in this place. That's the greatest thing. And that's what we ought to desire. And God was going to fill this temple with his glory. So God says to the people, get your mind on the present, what you need to do right now, and on the future, what I'm going to do. Get your mind and heart focused on my glory. That was October the 21st. Now the good news is, between the first message and the second message, the people had gotten to work. Uh, you know, any preacher would go for that within seven weeks, even sooner than that, the people are already getting busy. Because in verse 14 of chapter 1, notice what it said. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. In fact, it says on the 24th day, which means 23 days after the first message, they said, we better get busy. But as they get busy, God is saying, you need to have a vision of my greatness. Don't focus on what has been. Focus on what is and will be. Then we come to the third message, and that's found in chapter 2, verses 10 through 19. December the 24th, 520 B.C., about two months after the second message, and here's the message. Haggai talks to the people about their sin, and his message for them there is clean up. He says, I want you to gear up. I want you to wake up and see my glory, and I want you to clean up. Now, Haggai had two questions, and I, and I want you to notice this here uh, in verse 10. It says, on the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, now ask the priest concerning the law, saying, and here's the question, if one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil, or any food, will it become holy? Now, remember that day when food was offered as a sacrifice to God, it, it was considered holy. The only people that could actually eat of that kind of meat were the priests, and they even had to be careful 
how they ate it and where they ate it. And so the question is, you know, if, if you have that, quote, holy meat in a garment and it touches other food or even uh, other things that you may be doing, does that become holy? That was the question. In other words, uh, the question is basically this. Can a person transmit holiness? But then he had a second question. Look in verse 13. And Haggai said, if one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it be unclean? The second question was, can a person transmit contamination? So question number one is, can a person transmit holiness? The second question is, can a person transmit uh, contamination? Now notice the answers. At the end of verse 12, to the question, will it become holy? Can you transmit holiness? Then the priest answered and said, no. The answer to the second question can you transmit uncleanness or contamination? So the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. Now here's the focal point. In fact, the key thematic verses here were chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Here's why I pulled those verses as a focal point. The people were discouraged. They were unmotivated. And the reason they were discouraged and unmotivated was because of their sin and disobedience. You know, sin and disobedience contaminates, and it can spread. They can corrupt. Here the people are working on the temple, but they're not working with pure hearts. Now, they can't transmit holiness to the temple by their work, but I, they can translate corruption and defilement. They can be doing the work of the Lord with unclean hearts and unclean hands. And what is Haggai trying to tell the people here? Now, their primary problem was not a motivational problem. It was not a, an economic problem. It was not a logistical problem. It was not an adversarial problem, even though they had enemies. They didn't need a motivational speaker to come in and pump them up. They didn't need a financier to come in and show them how they could afford to pay for the construction of the new temple. They didn't need an engineer to solve their logistics issues. They didn't need a general to tell them how to deal with their enemies. Haggai is telling them here, you've got a spiritual problem. And in verse 14 of chapter 2, Haggai answered and said, so, so is this people, and so is this nation before me, says the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. Now the point of those two provocative questions were to point out what we all know to be true. We cannot transmit our health to someone else. If I were a perfectly healthy individual, and I'm not, I wish it were, but I came to you and you had some sickness, and I, and I said to you, you know what I'd love to do? I'm going to share some of my health with you. I can't do that. Might want to do it, but I can't do it. But we do know that somebody else can transmit their disease to us. There are certain things we can get infected with. You ever been around anyone that had a cold and then a few days later you have a cold? Uh, we just know that to be true. That's the way it works in life. You pour a glass of filthy water into a glass of clean water, I want to ask you this, is the clean water's purity going to solve the contamination of the filthy water, or is the filthy water going to pollute the clean water? We know what happens in that situation. We cannot transmit cleanness, but we can transmit uncleanness. 
And so God tells the people here, your problem is a spiritual problem. And you can work on that temple all you want. Outward ceremony does not cleanse the heart. He says here at the end of verse 14, and what they offer there is unclean. That's why we tell people all the time, the Bible commands us to be baptized when we're saved, but baptism doesn't save us. Jesus said, I want you to remember me by means of the Lord's Supper. But taking the Lord's Supper doesn't save us. We're supposed to be givers. But giving money, putting money in the offering doesn't save us. We ought to be servants, but service does not save us. There has to be an inward change. That's why in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, if any man is in Christ... He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There's an inward transformation that's taken place. The greatest problem that any of us have is really a spiritual need. And we can't clean it up ourselves, and nobody can come to me and make me okay. There's only one person that can do that, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the one that can save us. He's the one that can forgive us. Uh, the Bible reminds us that there's any sin in our heart. If we'll confess that sin. God will forgive us. He'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so God's message to the people of Haggai's day was clean up. Get your spiritual house in order. That was December the 24th. And then we have the fourth message. And the fourth message was exactly the same day as the third message. It was December the 24th, 520 B.C. And we find that in chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. And Haggai talks to the people about encouragement. He says, look up. He says, you need to gear up. He says, you need to wake up. You need to clean up. And you need to look up. And this message was delivered to the governor. Uh, who was the civil authority of that day. I mean, he had been facing opposition. Opposition within and opposition without. And so God says, be encouraged. This is a message of encouragement. Notice beginning in verse 20. And again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. God said, I am going to ultimately be victorious. And then he says, in that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. He said, Zerubbabel, folks, you don't have to do the work in your own strength. I'm your power. I'm the one that's given you authority. You don't have to do it by yourself. And he even says this to Zerubbabel in verse 23. He says, I will make you like a signet ring. In that day, uh, communication was on clay tablets. And the king had a ring called a signet ring. And that ring would be used to impress upon whatever method of communication they were using in that day. And that meant that when it went out, that had the authority and the approval of the king behind it. Sometimes in our country, when we see legislation passed by Congress, it will arrive at the White House and you'll see whoever the president is walk in and sign. Well, that signet ring was the symbol of authority God's presence, God's authority, God's affirmation. And God is saying to Zerubbabel, I'm going to make you my signet ring. You're going to represent me and my authority. I'm going to bless your life, Zerubbabel. Whatever happened to Zerubbabel? Is he ever mentioned again in Scripture? Well, if you were to travel, and you don't have to, I'll, I'll show it to you here, to the first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. And you remember Matthew chapter 1. That's the hard chapter to read. It's the genealogical chapter. All those names in there. 
It's showing the ancestry, the line that leads to Jesus Christ. This is what it says in verse 12 of Matthew chapter 1. Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel. He's mentioned in the line of Jesus. When God puts his stamp of approval on you, it is a special thing. What a message of encouragement. Can you imagine Zerubbabel? He's got folks within that are discouraged and unmotivated, and they're complaining that the temple is not going to be like the old temple was, and some of them are discouraged by that. Some of them are so selfish, they've been spending all their time and energy and resources on themselves instead of God's house. And he's got enemies from outside that are trying to knock down any kind of work that they do. And God comes to him and he says, Zerubbabel, don't you worry about that. I'm with you and you've got my stamp of approval. I think Zerubbabel probably gird up his robes and say, okay, well, we're going to do what we need to do. What a wonderful thing it is when you have that. Haggai was sent to the people to tell them to get busy, fulfill their purpose, glorify God. I want to ask you this morning, what work have you started that you need to finish? Could it be teaching? Could it be raising children? Could it be serving? I mean, it could be any one of a number of things. But is there something you've been doing that sometimes you're tempted to say, I don't know if I can keep up. I, my motivation's not what it used to be. Fulfill your purpose. And I want you to remember three things that come straight out of the Word of God. Remember the Lord is with you. Chapter 2, verse 4. I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 19 of chapter 2. Remember to expect the Lord to bless you. In verse 19, is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit, but from this day I will bless you. And then affirm that God has chosen you. You know, God's chosen you to do something that he hasn't chosen maybe other people to do in the unique way that he wants to use you. The Lord said in verse 23, In Zerubbabel, I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. God is reminding us to be faithful. In 1995, I was, uh, I was dealing with the pastor search committee of this church. And I was in a church I loved very much and was excited to pastor and lead and serve in. My dad had recently retired and had become a consultant uh, for the company that he had worked with. And then he went through a pretty tough time emotionally. It was hard for him to transition from working all his life. I mean, it eventually got to the point that he needed a Christian counselor, and I suggested that. But he became very depressed. In the midst of dealing with this committee, and there's always a process to that, all of a sudden, uh, we decided that we needed to move Dad from, and Mom from Ruston, Louisiana, to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, near my sister. And uh, so I was kind of trying to get that all together. I traveled to Ruston. We, un we totally unloaded a house and took care of everything in about a day and a half. It's kind of the way I like to do things. My sisters didn't always appreciate it, but it's the way I like to do things. And we got them relocated. And the, the trial he was walking through was very deep. And so it kind of came to the point where we sensed, Luann and I, that God was leading in this direction. But I had a hesitancy, a pause. I was really struggling. I mean, we had been away from 
parents for years. That's just the nature of ministry sometimes. Nine hours on one occasion, 14 hours on another. Since we had been in the place we were in before I came here, we were 30 minutes away from her mom and dad. And we were glad for that. It, it allowed uh, the boys to grow up knowing their grandparents, and, and I was thankful for that. And now dad was going to be three hours instead of the many more hours that we used to have to travel to see them. And I thought, initially I thought when all this was happening, God, you're moving them closer so I can kind of have hands on with that. And lo and behold, this vagabond committee from Calvary decides to deal with me. And I was, I was struggling with that. And so I remember... I told Luann, I said, I have got to drive. It's three hours away down to Hattiesburg from where I was pastoring. And I said, I've got to drive down there and have a talk with Dad. And Dad really wasn't in a good place to talk, but I needed to talk with him. And so I, I remember I sat down with him and I said, Dad, the, uh, there's a church that has contacted me about coming to serve, and we've already been through part of the process and we were at the point where I was going to come in view of a call and I said you know I've struggled with this a little bit because now you're a little closer feel like I can do some things for you all that I couldn't do before um, but at the same time I feel very strongly uh, the call of God and he, I'll never forget, he looked at me, even though that was a time of trial and struggle, he looked straight at me, and he said, Son, you better do what God tells you to do. Now, I didn't have to have his permission. But when he did that, there was somewhat of a release. Now, I still came with concerns about what was happening back there, but I came. And all I can tell you is I think about these three things here. The promise that God is with me, that he was going to bless, and that he had chosen me made all the difference in the world. And by the way, that promise is for you too. God is a God of movement. When we move with him and follow him, he affirms that. We need to be sure we're moving with him. But when we move with him, he'll move with us. And we can count on him to be there. And it may be. I don't know what all the needs are here, but I found these minor prophets have been speaking to me and a lot of our people by some of the response I get from different messages. There may be some of you today that either need to get busy or get busy again. And you need to gear up. And there may be some here today that say, you know, I spend too much time worried about what used to happen. I need to be focused on what God is doing and what he's going to do in the future. And by the way, his plan for the future is pretty good. No matter what's happening in the world around us, and I need to wake up. It may be today that you're here and you say, there are some areas in my life I need to give to God. I need to come to him. And you see, Good, doing good works and uh, trying to be the right kind of person. That, that's wonderful, but that doesn't get you to heaven. I would encourage you to give your heart to Jesus today. And it may be that you need to clean up, but you can't do it by yourself. Only Jesus. As the song said, it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. And it may be that some of you have been discouraged and God's saying, hey, look up. I'm with you. My stamp is upon you. And if that's the case today, be encouraged in him. As every head's bowed and every eye closed, Father, we want to come in these moments and just give this time to you and pray that you'll bless and work and move 
right here, right now. You know the need of every person here. I pray if there's someone who needs to give their life to Christ, today's the day. And Father, that you would be glorified as a result of our response to you and your word. Father, you know where all of us are. May we be found faithful in responding to you this day. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask if you would to stand today. God may be speaking to your heart. I don't know what the decisions are. I never know what's going on in people's lives, but there's not a thing that God doesn't know. You need to come today. There's somebody here that can help you and pray with you. Would you do that? As we sing together today, you come. Well, amen. Thank you for your attention today. And I do want to remind you, if you ever have any question about uh, next steps in terms of salvation or church membership, j just feel free to come to any of us. Call us at the church office during the day. We would love to sit down and talk with you about that. Or you can do like one person recently did. They just texted to uh, that uh, number up on the screen. And uh, that's all you have to do. And we got to follow up and got to talk to them. So, Whatever is most convenient for you, we would love to talk to you about any spiritual need that you have in your life. Now, I want to remind you of something. Next Sunday is July 4th weekend, and so we're, we're back on that special schedule. If you're a member of a life group, Sunday school class, you've got Sunday school next week. You've got life group next week. That's at 915, uh, and then we'll have one worship service at 1030, and we're going to be wrapping up pretty soon uh, the Old Testament Minor Prophets, uh, the book of Zechariah next week, and then the book of Malachi the following week. And we got a special treat. I've asked Brother Ethan to preach on Zechariah next week. And so I'm looking forward to that. You will, you will be delighted to be able to hear uh, from this young man. I did ask him, what do you know about Zechariah weeks and weeks ago? And he said, I'll know a whole lot by July the 3rd. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. It's going to be a special Sunday. And um, you be praying for him as he prepares to deliver God's word to us. One service next Sunday. If you come at 8, we'll try to find you a cup of coffee until we get started, okay? Y'all have a great day.